beautiful morning at First Baptist Church of Gray, and we are thrilled to have you here with us today. On behalf of the staff and our good congregation, I want to welcome you to today's services. If there's anything we can do to make you feel at home, please let us know. Here's some things you need to know for the upcoming week. If you're a deacon, don't miss the meeting today at 4.30 right here in room 129, also known as the Sarah B. Classroom. As our sanctuary gets a small facelift in a few weeks, all activities will be moved to the Knox Center across the street on October the 7th. Preschool and children will meet in the children's wing and our two services will meet at their usual times of 9.15 and 10.45. No other groups will meet that day or night, so mark your calendars and we'll see you on October the 7th for worship at the Knox Center. Our biggest event of the year, City Lights and Howl Nights, is less than a month away. You can sign up to volunteer in your Sunday morning small groups at the welcome desk or online at the link below. We need a thousand pounds of candy this year or about 200 of these. And we're counting on the people of First Baptist Church to make it happen. Mark it on your calendars, October the 20th for City Lights and Howl Nights right here at First Baptist Church. Here's another great way for us to connect together. Life happens between Sundays. And using the Connect app, you can keep up. After logging into the app, your new screen helps you stay connected with members of your church groups. Upload photos. Share what's on your mind. Send out prayer requests. Invite group members to get together, start a discussion, and more. All directly from your phone. Jump in a conversation by responding with a comment. Or tap the heart icon to give someone your support. Share together. Grow together. It's that easy. So go download the app and let's get connected. Well, good morning. We're so glad to see you today on this beautiful September morning. We had a great first service this morning. If you haven't heard, we had nine people join the church this morning. It was a great service. It was awesome. So I hate that you missed it, but I'm glad you're here now. And if you're visiting with us, we are thrilled and tickled to death that you're here with us this morning. One thing we do here at First Baptist is we do things together. And one thing we do together is we sing together. So let's join our hearts and our voices together in singing praises to our God this morning. Let's stand and sing.
from an early age that the Bible is full of promises, promises that Jesus made or that the Lord made that he kept, and promises that have been made that have yet to be fulfilled. But we as believers know that the Lord will keep his promise. Over in 2 Thessalonians, um, we're reminded of a, a hard promise and a hard lead up to it, but the ending is so good. Listen carefully. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this, and you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the bread of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, so that they all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. The good promises that the Lord gives us don't always come immediately. They have um, some trial first. But as believers, we rest our hope in Jesus and Him alone. He is steadfast. We see it all throughout Scripture. I hope you'll join us as we sing a great old hymn of the faith that reminds us of where our hope rests. Would you stand and sing with us?
Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Y'all rocked it. Thank you very much. All right, to get all that, then you get me. Well, you know, can't have everything. Let's see where we're at this morning. We are, uh, we are, we are in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. And y'all can go ahead and get over there, get myself organized. Every morning, we are all creatures of creatures of habit, and. Uh, Every Sunday morning, I get up the same way that I always do, and same time, first alarm goes off at 545, second alarm goes off at 550, and I always make sure that I lay until that 550 alarm goes off, and then I get up and do all my stuff, and I go get breakfast, and while I'm getting breakfast, I turn on the television, and I watch Charles Stanley. I have been watching Charles Stanley for a bajillion years. Charles Stanley was born when Methuselah died. That's how long he's been around. I mean, Charles Stanley's been here forever. And he preached this morning on Genesis chapter 6. And you think, hey, that's pretty good at coincidence. Except he left out the first four verses. See, and that's, that's where the problem is for me is that I'm going to preach through those first four verses. And so I'm asking you to put a little extra attention into this thing this morning because it can get a little academic for a minute or two, but I want you to understand what, what the Scripture is saying. Now, we say the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Anybody know where that came from? Somebody say it out loud. Somebody knows. It's the Baptist faith and message. It's article one of the Baptist faith and message. It is the first thing the Baptist faith and message says. It's a part of our bylaws. Our bylaws said that we as a church believe, use the Baptist faith and message as our statement of belief. So if you're a member of First Baptist Church or if you're going to join First Baptist Church, you are saying that you believe this, that you believe that the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. So we say we believe that, but then let me say this about that. There are some passages in the Bible that are hard. They are very, very difficult. And some of them are difficult to explain and difficult to understand. And what we want to do is we want to skip those passages when we get to them. But we're living in a day and time that we don't get to do that quite like we used to could. Because see, when, when, when I was growing up, back a bajillion years ago, I was I like half as old as Charles Stanley. When I was born back then, we were allowed to believe in mystery. You know, it was okay if, if your parents said, you know, you don't need to ask questions about that. We just have to believe these things. And off you go. But we don't live in that world anymore. Our children live in an age of reason and science. And our children, even though these things were presented to us as hypothesis, as theory, they're presented to our children in such a way that the mystery is gone and now science pretty much can explain anything. So when you get to one of these hard passages and we try to dodge it, our younger people look at us and go, what's up with that? You say the Bible is inspired, that, that everything in here is, is good for learning, and you're skipping this. What is your problem? So there's a movement that's going on right now that myself and other pastors, we're doing everything we can to preach the full counsel of God. And that means that we have to dig into some of these hard passages and just hit them head on and if we can make sense of them we do and if we can't then we lean back and go I haven't got a clue but see the scripture says 2 Timothy three sixteen, 
all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And I remember in sermons standing right here in this spot going, all means all. Every means every. Everyone means everyone. So if I'm saying from this scripture that all scripture is inspired, then all means all. So then we got to deal with Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And these first four verses are killers. They are absolutely killers. So here, here's what it says. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they're corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off of the face of the earth together with the animals, creatures that crawl and birds of the sky for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with God. Now here's what we're going to do. There's three things we're going to look at this morning. First thing is we're going to look at verse 3 because it's the easiest of the hard ones, okay? And it talks about length of days. The second thing we're going to look at is the Nephilim, that section here that talks about, you know, it's verses 1, 2, and 4 that talk about the Nephilim. And we're going to look at how these verses apply to anything, how, how this operates. And then finally, we're going to talk about God's two responses to evil, okay? So that's how we're going to do. So first thing we're going to do is look at verse 3. And the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they're corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. I sort of have this thing. I got to get it out of my head so that I can move on. I have this thing going on in my head of, of when I would go to conferences or, or I would lead a conference at some point and the congregation or the, the people that were out there, we didn't call those congregations, but the people that were out there were sort of, oh, uh, you know, and we would say, okay, everybody on this side of the room move to this side of the room, everybody on this side of the room move to that side of the room. I would do that except half of you would have a heart attack because you'd be sitting in the wrong place. But here we go, all right? Here we go. Verse 3 talks about length of days. God says in verse 3, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. There are basically two schools of thought with that. The first school of thought is that God is limiting how old people can be. Y'all remember Methuselah? He lived to be how old? 969 years. Lamech, I feel sorry for Lamech because when it talks about Lamech, he only lived to be 777 years. You can imagine that when he passed away, everybody said, oh, he was so young. Right? That's what we do now. Somebody in their 60s pass away. Oh, they were so young. I'm sorry. That's what we do. That's what they think about Lamech there. But God says that I'm going to limit their days to 120 years. The problem with that, saying that he's cutting the length of their lives, the problem with that is it sounds to me like he's saying that this is going to happen now and it doesn't. See, Noah lives to be 950 years. And if you go to the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, you'll find out there were a whole bunch of people that lived a whole long time. Now, their lives started getting shorter, but they didn't get shorter immediately. I don't think that's what this is talking about. I think this means something else altogether. I sat down and I started charting out when people were born and, and in relation to what and when and how long it took from the time God spoke to Noah until the time the flood came. And it turns out that that period of time is just about, by Randy's calculations, 120 years. And this is what I believe this scripture is saying. That God is saying, listen, these people are corrupt and they've got 120 years left. The clock is ticking. If you come to on Wednesday nights to our, our, our Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of Revelation. And one of the things that I've learned in Revelations, I, I 
It's one of those things, you know, that you know, but then when you really get into study, you really understand is God's big into stopping and starting. God is big in giving a specific time that things don't go on forever. When you're going through a hard time, hard times don't last forever. When you're going through a good time, good times don't last forever. There's a starting point and a stopping point, and I believe that's what's happening right here is the Lord says, here's the deal. Your wickedness that's going on that you think you're just going to keep going on and on and on and on and on, 120 years from now, it's over. You watch. It's done. That's the easy one. Now we're going to talk about the Nephilim. Everything you've never wanted to know about the Nephilim. All right. Uh, that would be verses 1, 2, and 4. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them They were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Now, Nephilim are only mentioned twice in the Bible. They're mentioned here, and then they're mentioned again over in Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers 13, the Hebrew children have, God's delivered them from, uh, are y'all with me? This is, if your eyes are open, we're good. All right. If, if, um, They've, God's delivered them from Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. They've walked through the edge of the wilderness. They've gotten the Ten Commandments. They're at the Promised Land. They're at the Jordan River. Moses sends out 12 spies to go scope out the land. So these 12 spies go scope out the land. Two of them come back. Many of you remember the story. Two of them come back and they go, whoa, ho, look where God's bringing us. This is dynamite. This place It's got rivers of milk and honey growing in it. You should see the size of the grapes in this place. We're going to love this place. And the other 10 guys are going, you are crazy. The other 10 guys say, we even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. And we must have seemed, seemed the same to them. So the Nephilim are very, very large people. Some of you guys my age remember Andre the Giant? Yeah? If you ever watched the Gutfeld show, do you ever see the guy named Tyrus? Yeah, Tyrus is a big old boy. Anna, my daughter, told me she was uh, one of the music things she did at the University of Michigan, had her on the sidelines during a football game. And she texted me and she said, Daddy, you should see how big these guys are. Here's my daughter, she's five, six, I think, five, six, five, seven, somewhere in that neighborhood. And here are these football players that are gigantic guys. There was a guy yesterday that they were talking about. I think he was on Georgia, not Tennessee, because they're, you know, but on Georgia. uh, I didn't say anything the entire first service about Tennessee. Not a word. I was so good. He didn't wear orange today either, did you notice? (laughs) Just saying. Anyway, where was I? They were talking about this guy. I think it was Georgia. It may have been another team, though. This guy was like 6'8 and was 340 pounds. Now, that's a boy. You know what I mean? That's a boy. I was at Navicent this week. Uh, I was at the hospital, at the medical center this week. And, um, and there were, uh, we, when we got off the elevator, uh, I got off with two other people. And these two other people were not from around here. You could tell real quick. Their accents were definitely African accents. They were very dark-skinned people. Uh, They didn't know where they were going. They had trouble with directions. You could tell that they had not been here long at all. But one of the most obvious things about these two people is he was about five feet tall if he was wearing platform shoes, and she was sneaking up on him. They were both very, very short and very, very tiny people. If he weighed 120 pounds, it was because he was carrying rocks in his pockets. I mean, he was a tiny little fella. And I thought, because I've been studying the Scripture, I thought to myself, I wonder if they feel like they're grasshoppers among all of us people. Because, see, the only people that were their size in the whole hospital were children. 
all of the adults towered over the top of these two people. And see, that's when, when we're talking about giants here, we're not talking about Hagrid on Harry, on Harry Potter. We don't really know what they look like other than the fact that they were bigger than everybody else. So the point of this is that, that size is a relative thing. Just because it says it's a giant doesn't mean that they're 25 feet tall. It just means that they are larger people. Now here's where the confusion in this story comes from. Y'all hang in there. I know this is academic. There's a point to the end of this, but I want you to hear so you can explain it to your kids one day. Yeah, because they're going to ask and you're going to go talk to the preacher. The sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. Who were the sons of God? And who were the daughters of mankind that got together and had this group of people called the Nephilim? There are five schools of thought. And we're going to cover all five of them, but it won't take long, I promise. The first one is nuts, but it's true. People, no, it's not true, but people believe this is what I'm saying. The first school of thought, there are people who actually believe this in the world, okay? Are you ready? Now, please have a better reaction than the first first service did because they sat there blank-faced. When I read it the first time, I went, no. Don't be blank faced. Y'all can even go, no, if you want to, okay? There's a group of people that believe that the sons of God that married the, the daughters of men were aliens from outer space. Thank you. Maybe it was because they were sleepy. I don't know. But there are people that believe this. It's, I, I read it, I studied. There are people that believe this. And if you are one of the people that believe that these sons of God were aliens from another planet, please, at night, quit watching TV and go to bed. You need some sleep. Quit watching Alien, Predator, Alien versus Predator. Do not ever watch Men in Black ever again. No more reruns, no more reruns of Independence Day. No Battlestar Galactica. Forget all of that stuff because aliens, really? No, <laughs> no, no, no. That's number one. Whew. Number two, <clears throat> number two is a dodge. Number two is this. There are people who say, well, these will just, were just powerful rulers. Well, the end of verse 4 would say that. Yeah, it agrees with that. But it still doesn't explain where these people came from. This sons of God, daughters of men, it doesn't, it doesn't help you understand that. So number two, throw it away. Number three, I throw it away too because modern scholarship, there, there are some uh, critical scholarship that says that, that the mythology of the Canaanite culture blended into the mythology of the Hebrew culture till you sort of got a syncretism, a, a mixing of the two, so that really what you've got here is some old Babylonian mythology that got sort of moved over into the Moses story, and that's just the way these mythologies work. I, I know on that one too. They base that on the similarities that they've discovered between the Hebrew stories and some of the other stories. And when I was a kid, I was a nerd then. I've never changed. I've been a nerd all my life. I read little pieces of the Bhagavad Gita. I read little pieces of the other one that's name won't come to me right, Epic of Gilgamesh. I've read several pieces of several stuff, and you can see some of what's in the Bible in those things too, and you go, well, maybe they all got mailed in. Here's what I believe. Now, here's, here's what I believe, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident in this. Romans 1, 19 says, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. What that says to me is, is there's, of course there's going to be similarities between them because people that don't know God 
are still going to see God in nature and try to explain him the best they possibly can. And since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, they're going to see some of the same things that we see. And they're just going to put it into their own kind of words. I don't have a problem with that. I believe that would happen. We've talked about this. When you stand on the ocean, on the shore, stand on the ocean. When you stand on the seashore and you look at the ocean and that feeling you get inside or you go to the mountains and you look over this beautiful vista and the feeling you get on the inside of the majesty and the power of God, that's not limited to just us. Because Paul tells us that everybody can clearly see that in what God has made. So I don't hold the idea that this is mythology and all that. That's nonsense. But there are two views that are left. And sort of kind of an equal number of people hold to each one of these. Are y'all still with me? I know it's like a college lecture. I know. I'm I'm sorry. Y'all hang in there because there's a point that's tied to the back of this. All scripture is profitable, right? So there's a reason it was written to us. The next one, number four, is the sons of God, and people believe this, sons of God are fallen angels. And when Satan was thrown out, y'all know the story, when Satan was thrown out of heaven, there were angels that were following him that were thrown out of heaven too, and that these angels took on human form, exceeded the boundaries, listen to that word, those words, exceeded the boundaries of where they were supposed to live, they took earthly women as their wives, and they had this, excuse me, had these offspring who were giants who were bigger than other people. They acquired the name of the Nephilim, which means giant, but it also means bully, tyrant, followers, rebels, and apostates. A lot of people believe that. They base it off of Job chapter 1 verse 6, which talks about the sons of God standing before God. And in that context, it was angels. But I don't agree with that. And here's my reason is that the New Testament is commentary on the Old Testament. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 25 and 6, Paul says, but since that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian, for through faith you are all sons of God. So we're sons of God. So here's what I believe. Option number five, equal number of people believe this as believes the other one. This is where I fall out. The sons of God are from the lineage of Cain. Remember we talked about the lineage of Cain. They had nothing to do with God. They were going to be gods unto themselves. And they were of the lineage of God. And the daughters of men came, of mankind came from Seth. Remember we said that Seth was uh, the lineage when we read Jesus' lineage, that the, Jesus is born out of the lineage of Seth. Remember we talked about all that? Now, this is sexist. I know this is sexist, okay? So take it to the bank, post it on Facebook, talk bad about me. I don't care, but I have noticed something about some women, not all, but some women. Y'all have a penchant for going after bad boys. And you've had daughters that you've sat at home and you've gone, why are you dating him? Don't you know he doesn't treat you right? He doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. He's never gonna be good for you. Hadn't you? Some of you have, of course you have. I've noticed that because see, I'm a nice guy and I would watch these girls go to these bad guys that would treat them wrong and do all this stuff and I'm sitting on the sidelines going, but I'd be nice to you. And I would love you and take care of you and be loyal to you. And you know he's a jerk and he's always going to be a jerk. And there's no way you can fix him from being a jerk. Honey. There it is. There it is. Hey, okay. I see it in this scripture. I see that they went, that some of the daughters of mankind went with the sons of God, which were the Cain folks. And together, they formed a group of people. What do we say about Cain's descendants? They were very industrious. They learned how to make tools. We talked about they were the ones that invented musical instruments. You remember all that? These people were bound and determined to to prove that they did not need God. That they were going to live on their own. 
that they could do what they wanted to do. They were proving that God was not necessary. Now, that's more than you ever wanted to know about this. I will pass out a test in a few minutes. We'll see how closely you paid attention, and we'll try to burn in the knowledge, okay? What's the point? What's the point of knowing this? The point is this, when we read through this and we see that God put a limit on the number of days and we see that God set up where this group of people should not have anything to do with that group of people, he put boundaries around things. What the scripture is trying to tell us is that God created a place and a way of life That if humanity would follow that way of life and stay within those boundaries, then we would have a, a situation where we could love God and love each other and we would live in peace and happiness and contentment. That God designed life a specific way and he put boundaries around that. And humanity chose to exceed God's boundaries in every way they could. Now, whether you want to believe that this was fallen angels that were the the sons of God or whether you want to believe that it was descendants of Cain like I do, either one of those that you want to believe is absolutely fine because the point becomes the same. God placed boundaries in life that if you live inside those boundaries, then life goes pretty good. The problem is, is that we don't want to live in the boundaries, I keep, the more I study in Genesis, the more I understand that I have never preached sin with the power that it needs to be preached. Because we've, we've, I've told you last week, the word for sin is armatia. It means missing the mark. And we've always preached that, that I missed the mark. I, I was shooting at the target, but I missed the mark. And that's not correct. We miss the mark because I wasn't shooting at the target. I was shooting at something else. I didn't want the target. I wanted something else around the target. In my quiet time this week, all of this has me thinking, and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm praying, and I'm talking to God, and I'm talking to him about things in my past, and this thought comes into my head in the middle of all of this that said, none of that satisfied you, did it? And the answer was no. No, it didn't satisfy me. Why didn't it satisfy me? Because God has built life with boundaries that we're supposed to live in. And when we choose to live outside those boundaries, then there's not blessing out there. There's not peace out there. There's not contentment out there. It's interesting to me to see how the definition of sin keeps revolving around the word rebellion. And rebellion, you know, we want to talk about rebellious children and they, they go off and they do all these things and the, you know, preacher's kids are the worst, you know, they grow up and they get into all this trouble and all this stuff because they hang around deacon's kids and it just rubs off on everybody. We, we talk about that re- no, that's not, no, that's not rebellion. I mean, it is rebellion, but that's not, rebellion doesn't have to be ugly or loud or different. Rebellion can be very, very quiet. Rebellion can be wedding bells. Rebellion can be very acceptable, very pleasant, a happy little party. I was talking to a friend a few days ago who was talking to me about her life. She's thriving now. She's part of a ministry that's very, very successful, something that she wanted to be a part of all of her life. But when I knew her a long time ago, her husband had just left her. And when her husband left her, she was absolutely devastated. It was a very, very, very dark hour for her. She went into a very, very deep depression. It affected her job. It affected all of her relationships. She was as deep in depression as I have ever seen anybody in my life. She's out of that now. She's been married to this new guy for a long, long time. They're a very successful ministry. But she said this to me. You know, I should never have married him in the first place. Because he was not a Christian, 
and I was. I said, hmm. You see, God tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't become partners with those who do not believe. And this applies to marriages, and this applies to business partnership. This applies to any kind of partnership you can get into. Christian has a different worldview. We're going to want to do things differently. If you're in business, the Christian's probably going to want to help somebody and give something where the, where the non-Christian may not want to go quite the way that you want to go. You've got different, you've got different worldviews. So when you choose to rebel against God's direction, the chances are real good that chances are pretty good that you're not going to make that person more godly. Chances are pretty good that that person's going to drag you further and further away. God knows, so he warns us, don't become partners with those who do not believe. Now, let me say this about that before you go home and have a fight with your non-believing spouse. When you go to 1 Corinthians, Paul also says that if you are married to someone who's not a Christian and y'all want to stay together, then you should stay together because by your righteousness, you may lead that person to Christ. So wherever you are, you are. God knew you were going to get there. It didn't come as a surprise to him. You can lean back and go, I should never have done this. Well, you know what? You've done it now. So move on. God knew it, and he's using it for your sanctification and your growth. So don't get all wonky on me and come to my office and y'all fuss at me because of what I said. Because no, just no. That goes along with aliens. Just no. The point being, God put boundaries for us to live in. These eight eight verses in Genesis talk about that. God has parameters set around how a godly life should be lived. And there are two ways that he reacts to that sin. There's two ways that he reacts to us stepping outside the boundaries. And the first way is he is deeply grieved. He watched the world. He observed that human wickedness was widespread on the earth. He observed that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Evil is defined as bad, disagreeable, malignant, displeasing, vicious, and rebellious. And that's what the human mind is all of the time. And he decided he was going to wipe the slate clean. The word here literally means blot out. It's the same idea as taking a whiteboard, erasing what's on it to such a point that you can never tell that anything was on there in the first place. They're all gone. Totally. And you know what? He's going to do that again. He's going to do that again. What Logan read to us is a precursor of that. Jesus says in Matthew 24, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all the way. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. This is why you're to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you don't expect. There's nothing wrong with eating and drinking. If you don't eat and drink, you die, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with marrying and giving in marriage, as long as we're doing those things with regard for God. But if we're not doing those things with regard for God, we're just doing what we want to do, then there is something wrong with them. That is sin. And God responds to sin in two ways. One way is he ultimately destroys it. His wrath is kindled against sinful people that are not his. His wrath is kindled against sin. But God is gracious and God is merciful and he's patient and he's kind. And the second way, he, the second way that he deals with sin is to make a way for those who believe to escape. He did it for Noah because Noah found favor with him and he'll do it for us as well because the Messiah was born through Noah's lineage and we know who the Messiah was. We know that the Messiah was crucified for our sins. We know that he was buried for our rebellion. We know that he was raised to new life so we could be new So that on those times, even as God's children now, when we choose to not even shoot at the target, we are still his children. We are never under his wrath ever again. We are never under condemnation ever again from him. We are his child who he brings back to be like Jesus. 
Those are the two ways he deals with it. If you choose not to follow God, if you true choose not to trust Christ as your Savior, then you seal your own fate and God's wrath rests on you. But if you choose to follow Jesus, if you hear his voice and you follow him, then you're seated at the right hand of the Father with Jesus in heaven. And you will live and see him face to face one day. That's what this scripture is all about. That's what the scripture is telling us. That God's put boundaries and people have chosen to live outside those boundaries. But God in his infinite mercy and his infinite grace has said, I have a way to get you back in. So choose which one you will follow. Choose which one you will do. Y'all pray with me. Our precious Father, open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears, Lord, that we might hear your truth. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we might see the holy design of your creation. And open our ears that we might hear the call of your spirit as you call to us to salvation. Father, we know ourselves. Lord, you you know that we love you, and at the same time, we're just like Paul. The very things we do that we want to do, we do not do, and the very things that we don't want to do are the very things that we choose to do. And Father, without your mercy, we would be lost. But because of your mercy, we are saved. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made to cleanse us and make us holy in your sight. Father, hold us ever closer so that we will walk with you all the days of our lives. Never stop calling to us, Father, for we so desperately need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I guess you heard the invitation. It's pretty plain. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What will you choose? What will you choose? If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, then you're living under wrath. So well, God wouldn't send me to hell. No, what he would do is he would let you go on your own because of the choice that you made. I implore you to choose Jesus. I implore you to turn away from the way that you've lived and turn to Jesus and say, I want to live by your divine wisdom for the rest of my days. And let him save you. And let him take you into into eternal life with him. If you do that this morning, I'd invite you to come down and talk to me. Say something to me about it down front. Let's celebrate with you. And for everybody else, guys, we deliberately choose to live outside the boundaries. And you can look around this room and you can see all of the fine, upstanding people in Jones County. You can see many of them sitting in this room and go, oh, they've never. Yeah, they have. They most certainly have. Every one of us had. But God made a way through Jesus for us to be forgiven and for us to be free. We don't have to worry about rules every day. Sure, we want to be like Jesus as much as we can, but sometimes we're just twits, all on our own, without any help. We know what's the right thing to do, and we choose the wrong thing anyway. And yet, even then, there is no condemnation. There's a loving Father who says, come on home, come on home. Let me clean you up, let me wipe you off. Let's walk the path again together. I think that deserves a prayer this morning of thank you. So as we stand to sing, thank him for the salvation that he's given to you. If you wanna join First Baptist, now's the time to come. We had a bunch this morning that came forward. If you want to, come on down. Whatever you feel the Spirit leading you to do right now, won't you do it as we stand and sing? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be will be forever mine. You are forever mine. All right, just a couple of things I want to cover with you real quick before we go on read these names out. So when you see these people, if you know them, you'll say something to them and welcome them. Welcome them into the fellowship. They, many of them have been coming for a while, but here you go. And I want you to think about the song we just sang, that my chains are gone, I've been set free. Y'all, that's, that's, that's the point. That's the point. Our chains are gone. We wrap a lot of chains around ourselves, and I'd like for you to go home and think about the, that this week. We still live in a tremendous amount of bondage, not because, not because Christ has put us in that bondage, but because we put ourselves in that bondage. We are free. We can mess up, and it's okay. We don't deliberately try to mess up. Yeah, sometimes we do. But even when we mess up, our Father is there, and there 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't you forget that. Don't you forget that. There's grace in that for you, and there's grace in that for everybody that you touch. So, I won't preach that sermon. These people joined in the first service this morning. Renee and Warren Stripling have come. Carissa Robinson has come to move her letter here. Her daughter, Elizabeth Rose, came by, um, uh, wants to be baptized. She's trusted Jesus as her Savior. Mitchell and Wendy Helms. Wendy sings in the choir. Uh, Mitchell and Wendy have joined. They come from the Methodist church, but they were both baptized as Baptists a long time ago, so we hadn't got to do any redunking. They're good. Levi and Rachel, young, uh, Rachel Wood have a young daughter, Evelyn, who's downstairs, and they're we're in the first service, I said that already. Uh, they're moving their letter from a sister church over in Milledgeville. And this one this morning was a little different because, see, see y'all listen to me. Y'all listen to me, and y'all take this serious. Y'all take, some of you do, because I know some of you have been doing this for years and years and years. We sat down in our, in, our, in our staff meeting one day, and we wrote up a list of people that we wanted to see saved, and we started praying for those people. This morning, the fourth one of four came. The other three had already been so, uh, saved, and God sealed the deal today. Tucker Mix came forward this morning trusting Jesus as his Savior, and we're going to baptize Tucker. Let me tell you something. Don't quit praying. You don't stop praying. They may be a 1,000 years old, and you may be a 1,020 years old. You keep praying. Because remember George Mueller? I don't know if y'all remember ever studying about him or talking about him or anything like that. Mueller prayed for guys to be saved all of his life. And he died, and that last guy was finally saved after he died. Don't quit. The Lord answers prayer. That's all I got to say. You want to pray? You want to pray or you want me to? (laughs) Thank you, Tennessee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for answering prayer. We thank you so much, Lord, for loving us. Thank you so much, Lord, for guiding this church. And I pray as you continue to guide us that we would continue to look for you and to see your hand. And Father, I pray for all of us as we, as we put bonds on ourselves to hold ourselves back, that we think we have to do all these things that all these people tell us to do. Father, that we understand that there is freedom in Jesus and that you tell us to join up with you, that your yoke is easy and light, that there'll be trouble and hardship, yeah, but we're walking with you with the one who is all-powerful and all-knowing, all-wise, all-comforting, all-merciful. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. Bless this congregation as it goes. Keep them safe this week in your peace. Let them see you somewhere so they can give you to someone somewhere themselves. In Jesus' name, amen.